What is going on, Trash Talkers? We are back with another episode for you. Today, we start off by recapping the first three games of the NBA Finals and break down how the Lakers have been able to outmatch the Miami Heat through the first three games. Plus, we look toward the rest of the series and debate who will come out on top. Then we jump over to the NFL, where we discuss all of the major news and storylines coming out of Week 4. As an added bonus, we will go over our NFL power rankings going into Week 5. Finally, we discuss the ongoing Major League Baseball playoffs and give our predictions for who we think will be in the World Series. All that and much more coming your way right now. Nick, we are vastly in it, my friend. We have the NBA Finals. We are in full swing of the NBA season. MLB playoffs are upon us. Hockey just finished, and I don't have time to sleep to catch up with everything that's going on. Uh, how are you doing? No, uh, I mean, I'm doing pretty well. Uh, I've obviously been focusing on football. I think that's what everybody's really been focusing on, but... Now we've got the MLB playoffs, and it's been exciting. I mean, you've got the Grand Slam Padres, you've got the the Yankees who are you know back at full strength, and they're they're showing up. Uh, we've got the the villains in the Astros who are doing some work right now. So there's a lot going on in the in baseball right now. So very interesting times to say the least. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we have specific fans who clamor every week that we don't cover baseball enough and uh you know i said you know the time is coming and we will get to it after after uh things calm down and you know i mean there's nothing like playoff baseball it's it's hard to watch the the regular season but postseason baseball is something different yeah and you know i i've gotten on my high my high horse a couple of times about how the mlb season is too long and this like specific games don't actually matter um playoff baseball obviously every game matters every pitch matters every at bat matters like there's there's so much riding on every single second and moment and as a as a sports fan i think we can all appreciate the moment that uh, we get to uh take in well they, ju- they just had a 60 game season roughly right would you say 60 games is a better fit like what do you think more people tuned in for the 60 game season than the 162 game season or should there be like around a hundred games or, or less than sixty games? Like, what what what's a good number? I feel because personally, I would like to see even less than sixty games, where each game matters that much more, and you're keeping players healthy, so they're not playing every day, and and they're getting some rest. With baseball, I think you have to. I think sixty is a little low. Actually, I think I'd like to see something like an uh, you know, like an eighty-one, eighty-two game season, just half of what it nor- currently is. Um, because if, if you take that and you start it in March or April, mm-hmm. right, we're not getting to this point, right? Um, the, the issue I think is that while I think a lot of people would have tuned in, you had the NBA, you had football on the rise or about to come back. And then you had hockey and playoff hockey is a life of its own. I mean, you know, as much as I do, any anybody who has a remote interest in hockey pays attention to the NHL playoffs. And then with the NBA, I mean, the NBA is vastly growing, has far and away exceeded to become the number two sport in the United States and possibly the world, um, be, you know, for the world behind soccer and the United States right. behind American football. Yeah. Um, but just... Overall, I, th- I think baseball is going to struggle with timing. Um, I think they're going to have to look at possibly either shifting the season. And it's going to be tough because NBA is doing the same exact thing. Adam Silver has already said that he wants to take a look at possibly shifting his season and you know ending it right around the same time that NFL football starts right back up. So, you know, the, Major League Baseball has to make some very tough decisions moving forward. Um, and it's probably going to you know if they make the right decisions it'll probably piss off the older crowd 
at some point it's got to happen and at, at some point you know the older crowd is going to be us so you might as well start making the changes now <laughs> Exactly. I mean, if you don't want your sport to die out, you you gotta you gotta modern modernize it somehow, and you know. Exactly. So, all right. Before we get too off topic and uh, away from things, I wanna I wanna just address the elephant in the room. The NBA Finals are here. We are in full swing. We have the Lakers and the Miami Heat, just like everybody guessed from the beginning of the season, right? Um, obviously, the Lakers have taken a commanding two to one lead and it's tough to say commanding two to one, but every game that the Lakers have won has been an absolute domination and they were even in their loss. So I think overall, you know, the, the Lakers have shown that they're ready for this moment and the heat are kind of struggling and they're not only struggling, but they're struggling with injuries bam out bio going out with his shoulder injury. He, he basically couldn't even move his arm uh, full, full extension. Goran Dragic has his uh, torn plantar fascia, uh, fascia in his foot, which he suffered in the Boston series. Uh, they were both out games two and three. And uh, as of right now, this is before game four that we're filming this. Um, Bam Adebayo is not playing, I, I believe. And Goran Dragic is going to try to give it a go. He's going to warm up with the team, but uh, see, they're going to test the foot and see if he can plant, if he can, you know, do a couple different things. But if he can't do that, he's not going to be able to go either. Um, with that being said, uh, you know, what what do you think about this series so far? Um, and what do you think about the Heat's chances of coming back and making this an actual series? I mean, yeah, what a disappointment for the Heat. At the beginning of the series, game one, you lose two of your biggest stars that have carried you and gotten you to this point. And then you kind of lose all hope going into the rest of the series. And you're thinking there's no way you're going to win the series, let alone win a game. And then in game three, Jimmy Butler is like, all right, I'm going to put the team on my back. No one else seems to to want to step up and, and help lead this team. So I'm just going to do it myself puts up 40 points, puts up what Anthony Davis and LeBron do combined. So it's going to take an effort like that every game this series in order for the Heat to be in it, not to win it, just to be in it. And yeah. you're going to need the surrounding guys, you know, Kelly Olynyk and Tyler Hero, Duncan Robinson, those guys to put up 15 to 20 points a game like they did in game three. I can't see that happening for the rest of the series. I can't see that happening another game. That LeBron and Anthony Davis, they had a down game. And everybody around them also just played like crap. You know, th that's just how it goes for them. They're they're either hot or they're not. And most of the time they're hot. And I don't expect them to, to be cool at any point uh, throughout the rest of the series. So, you know, it, it's great that Miami was able to come away with a win. So they're not completely blown out of this final series. But... Uh, you you better uh, enjoy the the win while you have it because I think it's it's time for the Lakers to put two games away and take home the championship. Yeah, I was I mean I, I was as high as anybody was on the Miami Heat going into the series. I even picked them to win it in seven, uh, but I couldn't have foreseen Bam Adebayo and Goran Dragic going down in game one. Um, that that vastly shifts everything. I mean. Uh, the momentum, uh, just the 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 sheer power and domination that the the Lakers now control. Um, you know, you're you're just they they showed that they control the boards, they control the paint, and they control the entire baseline. Um, I you know I don't think Kelly Olynyk can can stand up to you know Javale McGee and Dwight Howard and and those big guys Anthony Davis down there. Um, I, I just think that overall the, the Lakers have the team right now that they, they are the healthy ones. They have won the war of attrition. I have to give the nod to them. I don't see the Miami heat coming away with another game. I think LeBron James is going to blanket coverage uh, Jimmy Butler for the rest of the series. They're going to switch between him and Anthony Davis, and they're going to make Duncan Robinson, Tyler Hero, Jay Crowder, Andre Guadalla, and those boys uh, score all the points. They're they are not going to let Jimmy Butler beat them again. And you know, I, I fully expect that the the Lakers will take this home in five. Yeah, I mean, I think the Lakers realized after Game Three they became too relaxed and too complacent in what 
they thought was going to be a coast to the to the trophy and it's clearly not going to be the Miami's going to try their best and so LeBron walked off the court before the game was even over in game three realizing that he had he was going to come into game four and game five ready to put this away he wasn't going to leave it up to the rest of the players on the team I fully expect him to be controlling this game putting up buckets left and right it's going to be the LeBron show and if it's not him it's going to be Anthony Davis these two are going to bring this team back and and this is exactly what I said I said it's going to be a five game series and and the Lakers are going to win you know this is I I expected Miami at full strength albeit to win a, a game in this series I didn't expect them to be blown out but uh, hey hats off to, to Miami for at least getting a win with the players they had on the court because that is an extremely tall task and and they answered the bell yeah for sure I, I mean like I said Miami's no joke they they have the requisite players to get it done and I truly believe if these if these guys were fully healthy and both teams were fully healthy and and had everybody I think this would be a really really intriguing matchup for a seven game series to watch uh, I honestly believe that but I, I want to revisit something you you kind of glossed over uh, LeBron leaving the floor now I have a obviously uh immense respect for lebron james not only as a player but as a person uh the things he's done inside the community and what he's been able to do as far as like uh you know building schools and just o- overall as a person he's done incredible things what i saw from him in game three walking off the floor before time fully expired was like one of the uh, that was on par with the decision uh, back in whatever it was, 2008 or whatever, uh, to, or, sorry, 2012, uh, when he went to Miami because it, the amount of disrespect for not only the Miami Heat, but his own team to walk off the floor before time expires, he doesn't finish out the game. It showed, it just, it was a blunder in leadership. I think it, it provides, it shows kids that it's okay to take to be salty about a, lo- a loss. Uh, he didn't show any gamesmanship. I, I just want to be a little hypercritical here about LeBron James and, and his um, lackluster leadership style at, at that point in time. Yeah, I really didn't take that away from from what he did because if you look at any series, it's not like you're dabbing each other up after a game. You're, you're going back to your locker room and you don't really talk to the other team until the series is over, so... This, this right, but it's, it's not a, it's not about you know conversing with the other team it's about being a leader for your team if you I mean if you really look that, at it what was their point two seconds on the clock someone you just needed five guys on the court i mean right. really really there should only they they should be able to just inbound the ball with two people there and be done with it i don't know why the refs couldn't just let it slide it, it, no one actually cared you made people I, wait there for an extra two minutes while they got people on the court they sh- what really should have do- happened was the refs should have said it's a five second violation turnover and then Miami inbounds and that's over. That's really what should have happened. We shouldn't have waited for the Lakers. I I, I just you know when I when I look at it and I just you know like I said I I'm I believe LeBron James is not a you know I think he's a great person I think he's a great player he's the second best player of all time um, but I believe that this was just a bad instance of his leadership. And I, I just, I want to make sure that I point out, listen, I, I, I try to keep it as real as possible, uh, you know, on this show and just in life in general. And at this point, you know, I, listen, if that was a high school game, I would say the same thing about the, the leader of that game. It's LeBron James. I'm still going to criticize him the same way I would anybody else. Doesn't matter. I, I just think that that was just a poor show of leadership. And I, I, w- I don't expect to see that ever again from him. Um, but I, I do believe that, you know, something like that needed needs to be addressed. I also don't expect them to lose another game or lose to Jimmy Butler like that i mean jimmy butler absolutely embarrassed him and he was ashamed and and that's why he he realized the situation he realized that complacency is not going to win them a championship they can't get too comfortable because they're missing bam and goren on on miami and so i I understand that it's just a lot of frustration built up inside you know leaders are going to have their mishaps and i'm not going to hold that against lebron 
Not at all. And I'm just saying, it, like I said, it was just one of those things that I wanted to address and make sure that we talked about because I believe that, you know, so those, again, if it was Giannis, I would have brought it up. James Harden would have brought it up. It doesn't matter. Just be not, I didn't just bring it up because it was LeBron. I brought it up because it happened. So I just want, I want that to be clear. Okay. Um, but overall, uh, you know, the Lakers, I don't expect them to to struggle the rest of the way. Uh, we'll see uh, how this shapes up. It, I will say this. If the Lakers win game four, it, it's all over. I mean, the, LeBron James will not let another game go by after that. If the Heat win game four, then we have something to really talk about. And make sure uh, you stay tuned to, to Twitter and the TikTok. Make sure you're checking us out on TikTok as well. Uh, we'll keep you updated there. Um, but I, I, I want to kind of switch gears. I want to jump over to the NFL because we had a lot of things happening and uh, a lot of storylines to follow. The first of which are the good old Dallas Cowboys, right? So um, they gave up 49 points to Baker Mayfield and the Cleveland Browns. Uh, that was one of the saddest showings by a NFL defense I have <laughs> ever seen in my life. Um, I, I mean, they they all looked porous. That Ezekiel Elliott got nothing going on the ground on offense. Um, the defense didn't know what defense was. I think they were still trying to learn the definition while they were on the field. Uh, do you believe that Mike Nolan, the defensive coordinator, should be fired? No, I don't put this on Nolan. I put this on Mike McCarthy and Jerry Jones. I think that they put Mike Nolan in a bad situation where he's set up to fail. I mean, if you look at this roster, who is really there besides the front four to to help out this defense? You lost two outside linebackers. You're left with a middle linebacker who's trying to to co play coverage and, and stop the run and, and, and command everybody else on the field all at the same time. And then you've got a rookie corner who's been doing well, but your veterans and your veteran safeties have been doing absolutely nothing. And apparently they're still supposed to be better than haha -ha Clinton Dix because he's the guy you cut in, in training camp. So or Earl Thomas, because they're not giving him a call. Listen, Earl Thomas, there, there's a reason that even the Houston Texans are passing up on him. I, I think this man just needs to, to hang it up. I don't see him getting a call from the Cowboys. And even if he does, I don't if I'm Earl Thomas, I don't know if I want to go there because I'm just going to be part of a, a sad defense that's going to get embarrassed week in, week out because he is not going to be able to do enough to help out this defense to to get the offense back on track as well. It, it's just it he is one man and only can do so much. It's going to take an an off season to right this ship. And it's it they're going to have to they're better off tanking the season getting a better draft pick because they they have no draft uh, they have no salary cap. They decide to pay everybody. Dak is going to have to get the rest of it in in next offseason. So, you know, you're going to have to get a, a great draft pick if you want to bolster this defense, unless you're getting somebody really cheap. It, it's just, like, the Cowboys and Jerry Jones have uh, have put themselves in such a bad situation financially and, and talent-wise. There, there's a reason they're here. And it, it's also part of Mike McCarthy. I mean, if you look back to what he did with Aaron Rodgers and how he mismanaged them and, and look to see where what Aaron Rodgers is doing right now, I mean, Aaron Rodgers is 17-3 and three without Mike McCarthy as head coach. Like, that's absolutely mm -hmm. incredible. You look at that, that defense last year, what they were doing in, in Green Bay, you know, that, that's still much better than what's going on in Dallas. I mean, it, the, the whole thing has just taken a nosedive since Jason Garrett has left, and that that's surprising because Jason Garrett was crap as well. Well, I will say that I, you know, I don't want to fully put it on Mike McCarthy just because the offense is performing really well outside of this Are they? game. Is the, because yeah, they keep fumbling. I mean, Dak keeps fumbling. Okay. Zeke keeps the, fumbling. That's, a, that's on the player. The coach has nothing to do with the fact that the player in the NFL, no, you know, because you, you have the, at this point that you have to hold on to the ball. You have the entire week to, to soak up some balls and start having people punch them out, try to punch them out, teach them how to hold on to a ball properly. Like you need to teach your players this, have them practice in these situations. These aren't bad weather yeah. situations. They're it's just carelessness. And this Dak is all Prescott has passed for almost 
1,500 yards in the last three games. He's passed for over 1,600 yards. Oh, see, there we go. So he, he, the, the fact remains that I don't think it's on the offense, and that's Mike McCarthy's specialty. I think it's on the defense, and I believe Mike Nolan is to blame here because he is the one that said, ha-ha, Clinton Dix is not up to snuff. He is the one that has not gone to Jerry Jones and said that we don't have the requisite talent to get it done. He is the one that has come up with the defensive schemes that allowed 49 points on the uh, on the board. And and it's not to uh, an offense that was overly you know uh, aggressive or one that is even uh, remotely in the in the top echelon of offenses in the NFL. It, the Cleveland Browns have struggled all season to put points on the board. In fact, they were possibly shopping Odell Beckham Jr. prior to this game, and now he has three touchdowns and an insane amount of yards. I, you know. They made the Cleveland Browns look like they should be Super Bowl favorites. And it's hard for me to take that away from Mike McCarthy. Obviously, some blame goes on the head coach, but I have to look at the defensive coordinator and say, what in the hell are you doing week in and week out when you cannot stop a lick? I mean, what are you doing to mask coverages? What are you look, doing to mask blitzes? What are you trying to do to confuse the, the quarterback? Because clearly it, it's not working, and I have to put the onus on the defensive coordinator. I think you got to get this guy some some weapons, some talent on that defense. I mean, Demarcus Lawrence hasn't really shown up. It's all Alden Smith, who just spent five years outside of football. Uh, there's no Neville, Neville Gallimore hasn't shown up. Dontari Poe has not shown up. Like where where is everybody? Like they just gave up 300 rush yards to the Cleveland Browns, and Nick Chubb only had 46 of them. So I yeah, I, I just Nick Chubb got hurt too. So like to Ernest Johnson, the guy who was in the AAF, got 95 rush yards on you. Who exactly? Exactly. Who undrafted? I rookie, mean <laughs> undrafted free agent. Like. <laughs> It's just no, I, I, I get it, but again, that comes down to I believe Mike Nolan's time as a defensive coordinator. I think has, you, got, you have has to start reached at the its top. I think it, it, it's they just hired it's, McCarthy, they have to give him more than four games. I don't, I just don't believe Mike what about, Nolan. How, I mean, if you, it, what, what if you to, go look at Matt Rule, what's he done? He's two and two, he, he's done pretty well. He's been in close games, he could have been three and one or four and oh. If if would you, know, you say the place... Panthers defense is better than the Cowboys defense? Not much, not much. I would say the Panthers defense is better. They they've beat better teams. Like you have one win. Like the Cowboys really should be zero and four right now. They, well, should they be absolutely should. They absolutely should. And there's no reason for it. I don't understand. I mean, again, if, if you want to talk about injuries, they have suffered plenty of injuries. Joe Looney is now out indefinitely with an MCL injury. Starting right tackle Lyle Collins is now out for the year. He's about to have hip surgery. You talked about Sean Lee and Leighton Van Der Esch not being available. Uh, they've lost plenty of talent. They lost Gerald McCoy before the season started. Um, you know, they had a lot of players that they were looking really good on paper. Um, a lot of those players aren't there anymore. Uh, and I, you know, I, I just have to imagine that this, that has taken a toll on this team. And I believe that, you know, Jerry Jones as the GM has not done a good job of filling those holes. He just I hasn't. I think you also need to give a little bit more credit to the Cleveland Browns. You want to talk about a coach who's only four games in? Let's talk about Kevin Stefanski and the amazing job he has done turning around this Cleveland Browns team. This isn't the Browns team where the fans are wearing paper bags over their head anymore. They're proud to be Browns fans, and they should be, because there's a lot of talent on this team, and they have real coaches that are able to, to utilize their talent properly. That's why you have them rushing for 300 yards and, and throwing for 200-plus yards. Like it, this, this team is legit, and they can't be looked at as the old Cleveland Browns. They are a new team with real coaches that are going to be taken far this year. Possibly, again, the Brown the Browns look good, um, but they 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 don't look as good as what they showed on Sunday. That if you're looking at a chart of where the Browns should be. There, there's a line and then there's a dot up here that that was their Sunday performance. That is the outlier right there because they are not 49 points per game scores. They're just not, that's not no, their offense. I don't think any team is 49 point per game scores. Even the chiefs, they're not. 
I yeah. mean, they could be as long as they don't face the Patriots every week, but we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, I, I just want to wrap this up by saying I believe that if you're going to make a change, it has to start at the defensive coordinator position. Mike Nolan has not gotten the job done. It's time for him to leave. Bring it. I mean, I, I know you had talked about this before. I'm not going to take credit for your idea, but Wade Phillips is sitting at home. I understand that he was once the former head coach of the, the Cowboys and, you know, him and Jerry Jones might have their differences, but overall Wade Phillips is looking for a job. And I, I don't think he would say no to coming to coach for the Dallas Cowboys and turning this defense around. I think it's time for Jerry Jones to hire a real GM that knows what he's doing. Jerry might be a great businessman. I mean, do you want to talk about rainbows and unicorns and other things that are leprechauns that don't, that are never going to, you know, come to fruition because we can do that. Jerry Jerry, Jones isn't giving up the GM position. Jerry world's got to come back down to earth at some point. Maybe if he wants to start winning some games, he'll, he'll hire a GM that can bring in some talent and will, and will have the wherewithal to tell Jerry Jones that hiring Mike McCarthy, who has done nothing in 10 years, is not a good coaching decision and not a good guy to hire. Jerry Jones has been GM longer than you have been alive. Let's just put it that way. Right. And how, 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 how many championships have the Cowboys won in my lifetime? Zero. 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 I, I understand that you're not, you're not, you don't have to sell it to me. I'm just saying it's not going to happen. He owns the team. He makes the decision. Well, so if he wants to continue doing his thing, I mean, you know, there, there's one constant throughout all these years, and that's Jerry Jones at the GM position. If he gives that up, then, you know, then we can talk. Then we can talk about getting a new coach in there. But until then, we're talking about a head coach that Jerry Jones made him stay at his house until he signed the damn contract. And I don't understand why he wanted Mike McCarthy that bad anyway, when there's so many other head coaching talent out there. Eric B enemy. Um, Does, doesn't you know, Jerry but, Jones have a son that can say that he's senile or something and take, take the, the team away from have him. You, have you heard Steven Jones? He backs every decision his father makes. Well, stop it. Maybe he'll grow a backbone one of these days. <sighs> you know, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, Dallas Cowboys faithful. They need to start, doing something they need to send angry emails to jerry jones or whatever but this this ain't it hey and I, I, like i, I, I said Dak, I, I think the first position is that mike nolan needs to get fired i i hope Dak continues to to put up uh, just absolutely crazy numbers and breaks the the passing yardage record by week 12 and has to pay Dak 45 million dollars a year i can't wait for that if Dak breaks it by week 12, that means the Cowboys aren't winning and they're probably going to draft Justin Fields or Trevor Lawrence with that pick because they can't pay whatever Dak Prescott's going to be asking for. That's for damn sure. Only The only games the Cowboys could possibly win this year are in their division, and, and that's it. Those are the only games. <laughs> when you when your division is headed by a 1-2-1 one, one Philadelphia Eagles team, uh, there's definitely something that needs to be done. The Chiefs have but, more wins than the entire NFC East. There's four teams in this league. I guess the, uh, the Packers do too, if you want to put it that yeah, way. In Packers, the Bills, Bills. Yeah. Yeah. Seahawks. Anyway, um, I think we've beat up on the Cowboys enough for this week, at least. We'll we'll, we'll start our uh, weekly segment of what the hell have the Cowboys done now. We'll, we'll revisit it next week and uh, see where we are at that point in time. <laughs> But I want to stay in the state of Texas because that that wasn't the biggest news that came out of this week. The biggest news was that general manager Bill O'Brien was fired, costing head coach Bill O'Brien his job. Uh, Bill O'Brien obviously fired after an 0-4 start. Um, you know, Houston, they, they lost to a Vikings team that has literally looked like complete ass. And I, I just... Also, Harrison Smith was, got ejected in the first quarter. Uh, he, he, he shouldn't have, but he did. Uh, um, I, I know. I agree with the ejection, but okay, that's not but, a big conversation. No. Either way, do you believe Bill O'Brien should have been fired? Yeah. No. Bill O'Brien should have been fired, but it should have been done a few years ago. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't. We, I don't, are, I don't, we are way late on this conversation. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you think about it, if if. Bill O'Brien was fired three years ago. Jadavion Clowney's still a Texan. DeAndre Hopkins is still a Texan. David Johnson's not on the roster. Like you, this team actually has a chance. That you, oh, you have your first and second round pick from 2020 and 2021. 
So <laughs> this team is in a lot better shape, and this team might actually have some wins. Uh, you know, the, Bill O'Brien, the GM, is the worst thing. It, it, it's almost as it's almost worse than Adam Gase, the coach. It, you know, it, it's the, at that level. So I think that this was way, like you said, it, it, it was due to happen. And I think Bill O'Brien, if you watch his his press conference after he got fired, it seemed like he he was uh, ready for it. He knew it was going to come at some point. So no big surprise here. Romeo Cronell, though, taking over. I mean, this is a guy who doesn't have the best track record. So, But the I, players I, love him, and they're willing to play for somebody like that. I think the players gave up on Bill O'Brien. I think that that's really what it comes down to. If you look at the – just outside of J.J. Watt, who plays every down like it's his final down in the NFL, um, you look at Deshaun Watson, you look at the at literally anybody on that team – they literally look defeated. They look like they have no passion to play the game whatsoever. And at some point, Cal McNair had to make a decision and say, you know what? We, we just have to let go of Bill O'Brien. This experiment clearly did not work. And I personally, I believe that his mess ups have set this franchise back maybe another seven years. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty bad because like you said, they have to rebuild. They have to replace DeAndre Hopkins, nearly impossible. You have to replace Jadavion Clowney, nearly impossible. And then you got to start building up the rest of the team. J.J. Watt is in his 30s, not getting any younger. Uh, Whitney Merciless, not getting any younger. Uh, you know, you, you have Laramie Tunsil, who has looked okay, but you still have four other guys on the offensive line that aren't holding up. So Deshaun Watson is running for his life and has nobody to throw the ball to it's just unbelievable the last Deshaun of Watson hasn't even looked good this year like even I mean how can you throw, how can you look but, good? but when he's had time to throw and and he's had a clean pocket and on the rare occasion that happens he his passes look off he doesn't look like he's excited to play it it literally looks terrible I hate watching it I just uh, I don't think it's good football I just don't. I I think Bill O'Brien sucked the life out of that team. I mean, how it's hard to stay stay motivated when you realize you're throwing to Brandon Cooks, who's beat up, Will Fuller, who can't stay healthy, Randall Cobb, who's washed up, Darren Fells, who who is a, a Kenny nobody. Stills. Yeah, yeah, your best yeah. receiver is tight end Jordan Aikens, and he can't stay that, healthy. <laughs> right. I mean, and uh, a shell of himself, David Johnson, behind you. I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, I was hypercritical of this decision of the tr uh, trade for of uh, DeAndre Hopkins for David Johnson. I'm even more critical now because it solidified exactly what I thought. David Johnson was a one year wonder. He was great for a year and a half, got injured, never the same shell of himself. And that's what they traded the best receiver in football for. They traded the best receiver in football for a shell of a former pro bowler. I still don't look at it like that. I'm not saying David Johnson is 2016, 2017 David Johnson, but I think that he was misutilized in the, in the first four weeks. If you go back to week one against the Chiefs, it looked like there was something there, which means there's some hope that he could still be that guy. You just need to use him properly. Use him more in check down situations. Use him more in uh, in some be you know better run schemes. Like He's not an up-the-middle runner. You know, that's just not right. who he is. So you, you're going to have to get uh, uh, another guy to do that job. But David but, Johnson but then that is also a very valuable pass catching back. But you're also talking about, again, it it's, comes full circle. The offensive line is trash, so you can't run the ball. So then you have to pass the ball because you can't move the ball any other way. Now, you know, def defensive ends and, and linebackers can pin their ears back and just head straight for you. And now Deshaun Watson's running for his life, but he also has nobody to throw to. I mean, it's literally a vicious cycle of just terribleness. And all it was all caused by Bill O'Brien. And this is why I worded it the way I did as when we introduced the topic. Bill O'Brien, the head coach, I don't think was a bad head coach. I think he did really well as a coach. I think he was one of the worst GMs we've ever seen in NFL history. For sure. That's true. That's what I think. Oh, so if, no, that's if a, he that's never fact, takes yeah. over as GM and they have an actual GM, I mean, you give him somebody even like Joe Douglas in New York or, or um, 
you know, n- name your GM, right? If that person, a middle of the road GM gets, takes over that job. I think Bill O'Brien continues to have his job and they have a roster that can truly compete for the top of the AFC at this point in time. It's just yeah, I, 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 it's totally possible. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but, you know, maybe he'll find another job. Who the hell knows? I he'll have might to find build. A, <laughs> he'll never be a GM, but... He'll never be a GM. And if somebody does hire him as a GM, uh, I'm just going to make fun of that team every single week for the rest he, of my he, life. He, I think he's still a solid offensive coordinator. So I think he'll oh, find that's a job. That's what I'm saying. He'll definitely find a job coach. as an OC. For sure. I think he's I think he's a great coach. I think a team that's struggling with their offense could absolutely utilize his services. Um, he, and hey, I don't but I don't think it'll be this year. I think he's gonna have to wait until the offseason to find another job. In all seriousness, if I, whoever the new head coaches of the New York Jets next season, I, I'd want Bill O'Brien teaching Sam Darnold. I so so this is I mean, we don't have this on the docket, but fuck it, who cares? Uh this is what I if I was a Jets fan, if I was Jets ownership, this is what my my dream shopping list would be. I want defensive coordinator Robert Salah from the 49ers as my head coach. Sign him immediately as the head coach in the offseason. First move. Then you hire Bill O'Brien as your offensive coordinator. I think those two in tandem, plus Joe Douglas at the helmet GM, you know, as long as he can loosen the purse strings a little bit, I think the Jets can turn it around relatively quickly. I, okay, but they're not get, Joe Douglas just got there. They're not going to cha- change him out. I mean, th- there's just oh, he no signed way. a six year contract. Of course they're not. Right, but that's what I'm saying. So like, if you can get Robert Salah as the head coach and then Bill O'Brien as your offensive coordinator, I think you have something cooking there. I think the defense will be really good and the offense will have, you know, they, they can start moving the ball really well and maybe save Sam Darnold's career. Yeah. I, I, I watched Thursday night football. Sam Darnold looked great. I, I, but now, and now he's out because he, he's injured because he doesn't have an offensive line or weapons, you know, <laughs> This Jets it's team. So sad. I feel bad it for really Sam is. Darnold. I don't because mean to, I don't, yeah, I don't mean to laugh. I just it's I'm laughing at the Jets, not at him. I just want to make that clear. I feel bad for Sam Darnold. He is when he says he saw ghosts against the Patriots, he actually did because and he continues to because he's just he's seeing people on at his feet 24 7. Yeah, I mean, you know, we want to. Uh, Shannon Sharp wants to call out double agents uh, or, or call Brian Hoyer a double agent. I mean, the entire offensive line for the Jets is a double agent. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think they're defensive linemen at this point. I mean, they are literally <laughs> yeah. attacking their own quarterback. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously Jets stands for just end the season. And I think, you know, that's where we are for the New York Jets. And we're, we're, re- we're ready to, to call that one. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what pick they get. Most likely going to be the first overall pick and uh, see how that, where they go from there. Should be interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but... I, I want to just move on. The Philadelphia Eagles, uh, I don't know how, they upset the San Francisco 49ers, uh, got their first win. Nick Mullins uh, did exactly what I thought he would, and he came back down to earth, and he basically threw the game away. Threw a uh, game ceiling uh, pick six, and uh, the Eagles just, dominated there you know they just played ball control and that that was the end uh do you believe that this was the momentum shift that the philadelphia eagles needed to win their division yeah i think that they could ride this i think if they can start getting some players healthy if that offensive line who who just continues to get injured every single week if they can somehow just put a halt to the injuries and start getting some players back yeah this team definitely has a shot because they went. They won one game this season. They won one game, and now they're on top of their division. So, you know, your your next competition is the Cowboys, and, and doesn't look like they're going to win a game anytime soon. So you have some time to figure this out. All you have to do is stop the bleeding with the injuries, and, and you should be fine. Doug Peterson is still a good coach. Carson Wentz still has some talent. They just need some weapons. They need some people to stay on the field for the entire game. Yeah, I think the the defensive front is solid. They have done an amazing job. Darius Slay has been amazing. They have some safeties that have been doing better throughout the season. They just need, they have some holes, but 
they they are much better than everybody else in this division. And I think that they are going to figure it out. It's just taking a while. It's they're going to figure this out and I think this is the start of the turnaround. I vastly disagree. A 1-2-1 one, one start to the season is not momentum. I don't care if you won the, your last game in, in that sequence. It does not matter to me. A 1-2-1 one, one start is deflating for any football team. And the fact that they tied the Cincinnati Bengals of all teams, I mean, it just goes to show. The Eagles, they str- I, don't, I don't believe in Carson Wentz. He's not shown me anything since he his uh, injury during their Super Bowl uh, year. I, he's not showing me since, shown anything since then. Um, outside of Miles Sanders, I don't know. Uh, uh, Miles Sanders and Zach Gertz. Outside of those two, I don't think you can trust anybody else on this offense. The offensive line is depleted and a half. Uh, you, I mean, the, Lane Johnson and Jason Kelsey and maybe Jason Peters, but he still looks slow and he's stoic almost. I mean, he he's it, he's not doing a great job out there. Um, I mean, it's tough. And then on the defensive side, I'll give you the D-line. They look solid. Brandon Graham, Fletcher Cox, um, what's the sweat, his first name? Um, I can't remember. Uh, Josh. Josh Sweat, yeah. Um, th- those guys – Solid, Darius Slay, really good job. I I won't give anybody. I don't even know anybody else for for name recognition. Like everybody else, just gets run through every single time. I I don't believe. I don't believe that the Eagles have what it takes right now to win this division. I just don't. I, I believe that. Do you really think the, the Cowboys second- can can win this division? Do you think the Redskins? Oh, I'm sorry, the Washington Football Team. Can they win this division? Uh, I don't. Oh, or think it's how about, about the the Saquon Barkley-less New York Football Giants? I don't think it's about winning the division. I think it's about not losing it at this point. I mean, you know, the 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 fact remains is that these teams all have to play each other, and you know as well as I do that divisional games are the hardest games you play or the toughest games you play. Um, I think we're going to learn a lot this week with the Cowboys and the Eagles playing each other. Um, but I do believe that the Cowboys still will come out on top in this division. And I don't believe it will be with a winning record. I I truly don't. I don't see, I, it's a damn shame that somebody from this division has to make the playoffs. It really is hmm. because if it, if it were up to anybody else, I'm sure they would like to add in an extra wild card spot and take away the NFC East. I don't expect there to be a winning team on this in this division, but like you said, we have there's got to be a winner, a, a champion, and I think the Eagles are better than the Cowboys. I don't expect Mike McCarthy to turn this around. That Cowboys defense is only going to get worse. Like they're they're not gonna figure it out because they don't have the weapons, they don't have the experience or the the, the talent. You know, it, it, it's just it's, it's a sad because it's I tr- sad I trust because the, the Cowboys have a lot of talent on offense, but their defense just can't do anything. At least well, the, the at least the Eagles have a front four that can s- stop one part of the opposing offense, and they force them to pass. And Darius Slay has been locking up the number one wide receiver for every team. At least they have I that. Think, I think that the Dallas Cowboys can score points. I think the Eagles can defend, but need, like the Eagles can't score and the Cowboys can't defend. It's going to be which weakness can overcome the other weakness because both strengths are going to are going to shine at different moments in this game. It's going to be about which weakness overcomes it itself, uh, whether it's the Eagles offense or the Cowboys defense. And so, maybe see- the Cowboys offense can, uh, or sorry, the Eagles offense can score, but I, I don't think they're going to be able to outscore the, the Cowboys offense. That's why I give the nod to them because I just think the requisite talent that the Cowboys have on offense can overshadow some of the, I mean, the, the game that the Cowboys lost to the Cleveland Browns, they were in that game. They were, they only lost by a touchdown. So they're, they're still scoring plenty of points and they, they can put points on the board. The Eagles haven't shown me that they can do that. So 
I, I don't know. I mean, it's you want to be interesting. You want to talk about how bad the Cowboys are? They they go off sides and block a, a PAT that gets brought in for a two point conversion. Like that's how bad they are. That sums up their season. It's not getting better. But at, at least I mean, the Eagles. I, I think you're at least just the trying Eagles, to hate on them more than more than you're trying to. And why shouldn't them? I hate on them? Why should they have any love given to them? Why? Why did I they? Mean, why do they the deserve? Eagles. Because they have been dealing with injury after injury after injury. And for the Cowboys. What are you talking about? Besides offensive line, what else is there? Bes- Two like- outside linebackers. Oh, okay. Defensive backs. How, defensive how, line. Can you what name me? You name me. Name me the wide receivers for the the Cowboys. Amari Cooper. What did I say before? Michael Gallup. C.D. Lamb. I said they can put up points, didn't I? I said that their offense was really good, didn't I? They were within a touchdown. The Eagles of are a going 49 to forty-nine point defensive struggle throughout the season. Oh. Throughout the season, the Eagles are going to get back their wide receivers. They're going awesome. to get back Dallas Goddard. They're going to get better okay. on offense. Their defense the is going to tight hold end. Up. You, who do you want? You want Alshon Jeffrey? He hasn't proven a damn thing. Jalen Rager Deshaun is Jackson? getting healthier. Deshaun Jackson will come back. Alshon Jeffrey will come back. Deshaun at some Jackson point. hasn't done shit because he's been he injured. Done a damn thing he's been since injured he was in Washington. But, I mean, if he if he can stay healthy, he is uh, he's going to be huge for this team. He is a deep threat that was tough to stop early last season. Yeah, uh, I. It's a war of attrition at this point. I I don't see a winner either way, but I still I'm still sticking with the Cowboys until the Eagles can prove me otherwise. I, I just I don't see it the other way. Um, but I, I want to also visit the other side of the Eagles 49ers game, and uh, that'd be Nick Mullins being pulled for C.J. Beathard. Uh, Nick Mullins threw game game ceiling pick six. He gets pulled right after that. C.J. Beathard comes in, drives down the field, and scores a touchdown. Um, do you believe that Nick Mullins has seen his last snap as a starter in the NFL? Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah, there's nothing that I saw. And there was a lot of hype around Nick Mullins, too, because there were some people saying, wow, Nick Mullins. never a believer. Nick Mullins could challenge Jimmy Garoppolo for the starting job. And then Nick Mullins goes out and not only puts up a poor performance, but loses the game by throwing a game ceiling pick six. Like, uh, to, that, the Eagles, no to the to the Eagles, yeah. Some some no name linebacker that you know got you know still gets no credit because he's just a no name player. It's just unbelievable that Nick Mullins was able to Brian Hoyer 2.0 was able to single handedly destroy the hopes and dreams for his team. You know, I I, they, I hold them both in the same light. They're both terrible. I'd rather go grab the the seven year olds off the street or who's in the stands and use him instead because at least he could do a better job of handing the ball off or throwing a a short oh, a crossing route. He, he how do you not just have some common sense playing the game of football? How do you make it to the professional level? I just don't understand it. And with Kyle Shanahan as your quarterback, it's hard to fail with Kyle Shanahan. I mean. He made Matt Ryan look amazing. As your offensive coordinator. Or I mean, head coach, rather. It doesn't matter. Kyle Shanahan's still teaching well, you said, his quarterback. You said quarterback, so I was like, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> Kyle um, Shanahan should be the quarterback. <laughs> I mean, possibly. I just, I think that, you know, the 49ers just need to hope and pray that Jimmy Garoppolo can go this week. That, that's all they want. I mean, CJ Beathard didn't look terrible. We saw one drive. I mean... Listen, I'm not willing to crown him a, a better starter than Nick Mullins when Nick Mullins beat him out for the job, and then C.J. Beathard comes in and and runs one series down the field. I, I'm not ready to crown him just yet, but oh, I, I can say this for sure: Jimmy Garoppolo is still the best option on that team. Oh, for sure. I don't think that that has. Uh, I haven't been swayed either Listen. way. And to be fair, I never believed in Nick Mullins. I I don't care what game he won i just didn't believe in his ability to to be a requisite starter in this league or somebody that could be counted on to win games i just i i don't know there was just something about him where i just didn't feel like he had the the uh ability to to get the job done and he showed that he didn't the but, i mean the niners are about to go play miami 
in week six or in week five rather. And if they don't have Jimmy Garoppolo, there's a strong chance they lose this game. I, it's very possible. I think if you shut down uh, t- uh, George Kittle and you shut down Debo Samuel, JD McKissick's really your only option. And he, you know, what's he going to do? Put up one touchdown? Miami has a strong defense. You know, they're they're going to think of something. You're going up against Brian Flores, a great defensive mind. It, it, this is not an easy matchup for him because they are just playing so bad and their injuries have caught the best of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's been it, it's, it's been it, tough. It's tough for the for the 49ers for sure. It's you know, you, they'll, they'll overcome. They ha- I mean, you have no choice. You, you have to you have to overcome these injuries. You have to put talent out there. You have to be able to go out on Sunday and, and perform or Monday or Tuesday or Thursday or whatever day you play at this point in time. Nobody's playing. Um, but I, I do want to um, finish up the, the wrap up of the weekend with uh, one of the two Monday night football games that we had. Uh, and that would be the Patriots chiefs. Um Obviously, Cam Newton tested positive on Friday is when the Patriots found out um, for COVID-19. Jordan Te'amu also tested positive for the Chiefs, who's a practice squad quarterback. Um, Te'amu was actually the scout team quarterback that was replicating Cam Newton all week in practice. So the irony is not lost there. Um, The NFL made both teams get retested multiple times. Uh, There were no new cases for either team, nobody, no personnel, no coaches, no um, players, anybody tested positive. Um, So they were all set. The Patriots took two planes on game day on Monday to Kansas City. Uh, One plane was full of players that were in close contact with Cam, uh, most likely the offense. And then those who didn't have anything to do with cam or were weren't near him they took a separate plane just in case there was some sort of cross contamination that they had missed um they arrived in kansas city at 11 a.m central time with a game that was at 6 p.m central time so they only had seven hours from the time that they landed until game day started and uh plus an hour drive to the stadium right plus an hour drive so you're talking about you know, your entire game day ritual, your your schedule completely messed up. Um, you know, it very difficult. Do you believe, um, A, th- there's a couple questions here. Do you believe that the game would have been played if Mahomes had tested positive? Oh, for sure. I don't think the NFL has an agenda to make a game even by saying if Mahomes can't go, you have to you have to postpone this game even further. No, because I think they they wanted to see this game at full strength. They everybody has been looking forward to see Cam versus Pat Mahomes and Bill Belichick at full strength versus Andy Reid at full strength. Like that's one of the best matchups, if not the best matchup that you could ask for. So no, no the NFL would have wanted this game full strength and it wouldn't have mattered whether it was Cam or Pat Mahomes who tested positive. This game was going to get played no matter what. That's just that the NFL is, doesn't have that luxury. They're running out of that luxury of postponing games and, and adding weeks to the schedule. It's just, it, they just don't have that like other sports do. So no, this game would have been played whether Pat Mahomes tested positive or not. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I don't, I don't want to, harp on this too too much but essentially i I agree with you i I believe that as long as everything played out the same way that it did with new england where nobody else tested positive i think that would be the the case but if you know god forbid somebody else also caught it and it ended up like a tennessee titans thing obviously this would have been a bye week for both teams and then we're fixing around the schedule to to work around that that entire process but um as it stands I, i i agree with you now to the game itself. <sighs> the, pay, the I'm just going to give my analysis and then you can tell me what the hell you think. The Patriots defense played amazing, in, in my opinion. Uh, they limited the Chiefs offense to 26 points, and most of which came in the fourth quarter, in all honesty. Um, 
They they basically shut them down in the entire first half. Um and and, and they looked great. And at, technically, the Patriots had an opportunity to tie and take the lead going into halftime. But because they were quarterbacked by Brian Hoyer, the longtime veteran backup to Tom Brady, starter in Houston and multiple other cities, uh, he decided that it was a good idea to become a double agent for the Kansas City Chiefs. And he got strip sacked on his first red zone trip and then took a sack with no timeouts left on his second red zone trip. And we went into halftime with a game that was six to three. Do you believe that Brian Hoyer should have been pulled earlier? No, no, I I don't think you could pull Brian Hoyer in the first half because the biggest mistake he made came on the last play of the first half with that just not knowing that you don't have a timeout which everybody else knew in the world except for him which i think he actually knew he was just trying to make a good play and was like oh i'm gonna play this out like i i was just a moron and didn't realize that we didn't have a timeout i think that's i think he just you think he he tried tried to make like a tom brady play no, and I think he tried to make a Pat favor. Mahomes play. I think he just tried to to make something with nothing. You have nothing. In that situation, it's as clear-cut as it gets, especially for a guy who knows the system better than anybody else on the roster, a guy who has been in the league for a, over a decade. This is a guy, like, he's been with a team four times now, five times. He knows yeah. the system so well, and he knows he is a a, a player coach. Like, that's exactly reason, what he is. The he, reason he started is because there was no practice time. Yeah. So from Friday, at, once they found out that Cam Newton had tested positive, the entire Patriots facility had to have been shut down. There was no practices. Nobody could have contact. Everybody had to be in self-isolation until they could test everybody and make sure everybody else was clean. Because of that, they, they had to go with Brian Hoyer because Stidham, Jared Stidham, had not had any practice time with the first team offense, which shows me that Brian Hoyer has been practicing with the first team offense and Stidham has not. So in, you know, because when you, when you look at um, your emergency, right, you have to have a quarterback outside of your starter that takes reps with the first team. You have to, in case that starter goes down, that shows me that Brian Hoyer has been that guy that's been taking first team reps outside of Cam Newton and not Jared Stidham. No, I I totally disagree because Cam Newton's still learning this offense. You need to get him as many reps as possible. You're not expecting that, but you no, a guy you, no, who... You have to have a backup take. I, I, I don't There's care no he, football team that does. Great. I don't care if he gets 10 snaps. That uh, To me, that, that doesn't count. That doesn't mean anything. Especially when you find out, with, with the way everything went down, you find out Friday night, Cam finds out Friday night that he tested positive. It's announced Saturday that he can't go. They don't know until Sunday morning when the game is being played. And then on Monday, they're traveling. Like, I, I don't care if you have, you know, half, you're splitting half the reps with the first team the entire season. That is a lot for any quarterback to take on. And that, that is, and that's why we saw some errant throws in the beginning. And I fully expected that. And I was fine with it because that's just how it goes. And same thing when Stidham came in. That's just how it goes. These guys don't but get I the reps. And I didn't bring those up. I didn't bring up his interception over the middle of the field. I didn't bring up his errant throws to the sidelines because I, I, I understand all of that. What I'm getting at is his poor clock management, his inability well, but, but to this understand is the problem that they with had... Brian- this is the problem with Brian Hoyer his entire career. He knows how to play the game from the sideline, but when he's in the situation, it's like he gets nervous or something. It's like Sony Michelle trying to make a cut. He can't do it. He just can't. It's just he cannot play the game. He knows what to do in his mind, but he just can't execute. And that's been my criticism criticism of Brian Hoyer his entire career. He just can't execute and that's why Brady always liked him in the to to help him dissect film and all that. But you would never trust him with the team and that's why you saw the Colts do terrible with him. You saw the 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 
previous times he was out on the field for the Patriots. He would look or the terrorist in Texans. Or or, the Tex- I yeah. mean, he. I mean, Bill, uh, Bill O'Brien had... was also part of you know that that he was part of the Bill O'Brien era in Houston, and you know that has to be put on Bill O'Brien as well as that he relied on Brian Hoyer at times. And I mean, the only reason Sidham didn't start this game, in my opinion, is because I don't think he's fully healthy. I still don't know if he's fully healthy. He suffered that hip injury in the preseason, and he's been trying to get back from it ever since. I think they were forced into a situation situation where they had to play him in the second half. And he looked pretty damn good to me. He did. And everybody wants to point out that he didn't have many yards or he threw two interceptions. First of all, one of them is on Edelman. That's on him. And the last one, what I mean, he's trying to make a play in the end zone. Like, so I, I don't really care about that. So the game is almost lost at that point anyway. And right. I, I know you said earlier, I want to bring this up. The defense didn't give up 26. They did give up 19 points. But if we go through this game, they really didn't give up more than six points because first, they, they I mean, well, they should they should have had the interception on the first drive that led to three points. They and had the, the drops an interception. Yep. They had Brian Hoyer fum, uh, throw an interception that led to three points. That's that led to so six, and That's then their six. Then they gave up three which I believe is one of the only three that they, they, cause it became a, a, a nine to, was it nine to six game or no, it was six, it was six to three going. It was, to so it was six, six to three, right? Yeah. And then they, they scored the touchdown where JC Jackson should have had the interception. Right. Another and, miscommunication on the defense. But then we, we, we answer back with the, the Nikhil Harry touchdown. No. And then no, yeah, the, the that, timeline's off there. Because the the pick six happened before that. No, the pick six was the last score of the game. Pick six was the last score of the game. That happens in the fourth quarter. That was the game ceiling one. Either way, it doesn't the matter. Ste- the, 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 the Patriots defense the, played lights out. We're, they, we're dissecting this way too much. I, I, I don't care about getting into the nuance here. What I care about what, is saying that the, the Patriots, had they had Cam Newton... Not only were they in this game, had a very good shot at winning this game, and that is well beyond the 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 uh, idea that we had going into the season. Because I don't know about you, but I when I looked at the schedule, I said for the Patriots this was going to be a loss. It wasn't going to be a major loss, but they would lose nonetheless. If we had Cam Newton, if he doesn't test positive for COVID nineteen, and he can and he can play in this game. I fully expect that he would have done everything. Maybe not everything, right? Maybe he throws an interception. But the I, I believe that he would have been able to lead us to victory over the Kansas City Chiefs. Because if you're telling me going into a game against the Chiefs that you're going to hold them to 26 points, I have faith in Cam Newton and this offense to be able to score more than that. I just yeah, do. They, they, I, Especially I, on that defense. I agree. And, and things would have been a lot different because – if Cam's playing, they don't even score 26. They're not even scoring in the 20s at all. So right. the, you, all you have to really do is put up three touchdowns, which Cam can definitely do. Like the, Without Chris Jones, this run defense was abysmal. We put, the, the Patriots put up almost 200 rush yards. And Damian Harris, who hasn't had a snap since he's come back, who just came back, yeah, put, up over 100, came back. put up 100 rush, over 100 rush yards on, on the, the Kansas City Chiefs. Rex it's just Burkhead has had his build, way, and if they had Sony Michelle, they'd have a three-headed monster that they could continue rotating in. What I, last thing I want to say is, Bill Belichick coached arguably his best game ever. I've never seen him coach as well as he did in this game. The the way he he maneuvered that defense, I've never seen looks from a defense like that. That was just amazing mastermind call play uh, play calling that no one else in the NFL, I don't care who you are, could ever draw something up like that. That is just yeah. unbelievable. And that's I, why I can... pa- Patrick Mahomes had no idea what to do. And the more that Bill Belichick gets to play against Pat Mahomes, the easier it becomes for him because he gets to learn everything about him. For sure. Um, Tony Romo, as much as I hate to give him credit because I can't stand listening to him on the broadcast, he he showed us exactly what the Patriots were doing in the red zone against the chiefs where they are the, they are the number one red zone offense in, in the NFL. It, the, the Patriots were rushing. Um, they were just, they were 
uh, making sure that Mahomes couldn't escape the pocket. They were just closing in the pocket on him and, and containing him. What the outside linebackers were doing was playing flat zones while everybody else is playing man across the board. And with that, he couldn't. He never had the dump off to CEH. He couldn't run those shallow crossers with Mikko Hardman and Tyreek Hill. Uh, and and he had nothing to Kelsey or Watkins available at all. So the the game within the game, Belichick versus Andy Reid, and and the you know the defense versus the Chiefs offense. It, I mean, it was one of the most incredible chess matches to watch. And, you know, I, I absolutely love this because Belichick used to do this against uh, Peyton Manning in Indianapolis and Denver. Uh, he's doing, he did it against Pittsburgh. He's done it against Pat Mahomes now. Uh, this is one of those things that you, you just take your hat off and you're like, you know, props to you. Because, again, like I said, holding the Chiefs to 26 points and their offense to 19 is one of the biggest – feats that you can have as a, as a head coach at this point in time you're talking about an offense that can score 40 points without even blinking yeah this is um but but before we move on i do want to um bring up one thing and i wouldn't be a, a patriots homer if i didn't the officiating in this game <laughs> was absolutely abysmal tony Carrenti and his and his uh fellow comrades in in the zebra black and white stripes uh absolutely destroyed this game from a perspective of they had a terrible uh call for a personal foul on Dietrich Wise when he pushed uh Patrick Mahomes out of bounds when all he did was touch him um then the strip sack fumble that should have been uh, a turnover for the Patriots and possibly returned for a touchdown. I don't know if that's how it would have happened. Blown dead and blown in the grasp of a sack. Therefore, it's not a challengeable play. And then, you know, Bill Belichick's not allowed to challenge it. So the Chiefs run their punt team on and just punt the ball away before they can get any, you know, anything can happen. Um, this officiating crew was absolutely terrible. They did everything in their power to, to make this a one-sided victory. Um, and I want to, like, I, I will, on until the day I die, I will sit on a podium and say that officials are the worst part of sports. They absolutely ruined this game like they ruined last year's game. I, I can't put it any other way. These officials have got to under, like, they can't, especially with the sack that cannot blow the whistle so soon. I understand you want to protect the quarterback, but he's not in danger. And if you look at it, the quarterback is moving forward. So their whole premise of him being in the grasp and not being able to, to continue moving forward. If he, what if he was, what if the the defender wasn't there to cause, cause the fumble and he threw the, the ball to the receiver I don't think they would have blown that play dead because the whistle didn't come until after the Patriots had possession of the ball. What are we supposed to do then? Did is that a complete pass if he completes it to Tyreek Hill? I I just I absolutely can't understand uh what the referees are thinking in this situation. Um especially at such a crucial moment and you you know it's a crucial moment when you see Bill Belichick get absolutely heated at the refs and, and everybody uh, in the officiating crew because he'll get angry and he'll get upset but he is never as animated as I saw him on that sideline last night. Yeah. It, 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 it it's a it's a real shame and this seems to happen all the time when the Patriots play the Chiefs. But it, what, are, what are you going to do about it? You got to live with it. And even with those missed calls, those bad calls, this is a winnable game for the Patriots. So I really, really hope the Patriots get to face off against the Chiefs again this season because it's going to be very, very different. Oh, for sure. I'd, I'd love to see this in, in the playoffs and, uh, you know, how everybody responds, how the Chiefs offense responds, how our offense responds, uh, everything. Um I just want to, you know, I, I want to leave that game there. I want to move on. Um, we have our week five power rankings. Instead of going through them on this show, because you can find them, you know, anywhere. I want you guys to check out our TikTok. I want you to check out our website. They're both, they're going to be on there. 
I want you to take a look. Let us know what you think. Let us know in the TikTok, uh, in the comments, like, comment, subscribe. Let us know if, if you don't like where your team is. Let us know if you think your team should be higher. Uh, let us know exactly, you know, what you think uh, of the content we're putting out there. We're, we're trying to uh, diversify all the content we have. Our Twitter has been on fire. We've been speaking with all of you guys. We want to make sure that we continue to do that. TikTok is just another uh, vehicle for us to be able to do that and gives us a little more creative side of, of doing this show. So uh, make sure to check out our TikTok. We are, uh, the link is in the description below. Make sure you're checking out all the socials on there. Um, we are at trash talk sports underscore. Uh, that is our, our handle. Make sure to check us out again, like comment and subscribe. Uh, we would absolutely love to see it. Check out the power uh, the week five power rankings. All right. So I think we've covered football enough for this week. Um, we have one more thing to get to, and that would be major league baseball and the divisional series that has now uh, become underway. So the divisional series for those of you who may be confused about all these different series is a five game series. Um, so, and each matchup is being played at a neutral site. So the Rays and Yankees are playing in San Diego. The Marlins and Braves are in Houston. The Astros and Athletics are at Dodger Stadium in LA. And Padres and Dodgers are in Arlington, Texas. Uh, I want to start off with the rank, uh, Rays and Yankees. Uh, Nick, I just want your prediction of um, how this series is going to go. Uh, I mean, I'm a little bit biased here, but I still I think the Yankees at full strength are almost unbeatable. I mean, if, if as long as pitching can hold up, it's going to be extremely impossible impossible for a lot of pitchers to stop the offense of the page, uh, of, of the of the Yankees. I mean, John mm-hmm. Carlo is hitting home runs consistently. Aaron Judge is. Uh, you got Aaron Hicks, Gio Urshela. You've got all these different guys who are just extremely hard to go up against, and they're one after another in that batting lineup. I think this is a team that can go far. I think they're going to stay healthy. They're in the bubble, so they don't need to travel. So this is a, a prime situation for the Yankees, and I think that this is really tough for the Rays as well as they did in the regular season. I I don't think they have enough to get past uh, the New York Yankees at this moment. Yeah, it's going to be tough because, um, you know, the, the Yankees uh, feature the long, the long ball really well. Um, they're not in New York, so it, it – it's very interesting. As we saw from game one, they're still able to hit the long ball. Um, but San Diego is a much larger stadium The the outfield dimensions are much bigger. It's much wider. Um, excuse me. So that pre- presents a different dynamic, uh, than both for both the Rays and the Yankees. So it's not just lopsided. I believe the Yankees will come out on top. I fully expect them to, to dominate this series. I, I think the Yankees in four here. Um, Let's move on to the Marlins and Braves. They're playing in Houston. Uh, what do you like from this series? Who do you have? I like the Atlanta Braves. I just I think that they have more to offer than the Miami Marlins. Uh, they they had a better uh, season, and I I just I think that they have enough to make it through this series. Uh, I it'll be interesting to see how who Atlanta matches up with next. But this is one of those those series where they they're they're kind of playing each game like it lasts like they're it's their last and they have to because you know they they don't have the the name value of a lot of other teams they have to face and so they have to play with a lot of heart and i think that's going to get through them through miami but i don't think it's going to get much uh, further so i have atlanta i'll probably take them in six but uh yeah that's I a think, five game series <laughs> uh, I'm, i'll take them in five <laughs> um always getting the the series numbers mixed up right i understand mlb Uh, can't stay consistent baseball (laughs) does it so weird the the first the wild card is three games the divisional series is five and then the championship and the world series are seven i mean can we just make them all seven and call it a day please like the or make make the wild card five make the wild card five or i don't know just let's have some continuity moving forward please um but <laughs> I I also agree. I, I believe that the Braves will win this series. I think they're going to do it handily. I actually see them winning this series in three. I think they're just going to absolutely dominate. I don't think the Marlins really have a shot here. Um, 
that being said, let's move over to the Astros and the Athletics. Who do you have in this series? Well, this is an interesting series because a few minutes ago we found out that the Astros just took game two. So now it's a 2-0 series. Um, I think this is obvious that Houston's going to move on. All they need is one win, and I don't think that the Athletics have enough to, to get past them. The Astros are a great team, and everybody mm. hates them at this moment, but we, how many times have we seen the villain of a, a league go on to the the conference finals or the finals of a, of the, the postseason? It happens all the time, and it's, yeah, LeBron's it's, done it his entire career. <laughs> you know, I'm, uh, it, you know, this is just another one of those situations where the Astros are a very strong team. Uh, I believe they don't have Justin Verlander anymore, though, right? He's, he's no, he out. had Tommy John. So, so they, they have uh, Zach Greinke. So yeah, so they their their pitching definitely uh, took a hit, but they have the offense to to carry them far. They are going to have a matchup. I think they it's going to end up being them against the Yankees, and that's going to be a fun series to watch. For sure. Um, I also have the Astros here. I think their offensive firepower, even without the trash can banging, I think they'll be able to score some <laughs> runs and uh, get past the athletics. Um, you you said it's 2-0. I think it'll be a four-game series, a gentleman's sweep. Uh, if you will. So I, I just, I think the Astros have the requisite talent to, to move on here. Um, and then the final uh, divisional matchup would be the Padres versus the Dodgers. Uh, I'm just going to give mine real quick. The Dodgers are the best team in baseball. I see this going three games and I don't, I don't see the Padres putting up. Much I, I don't think you're giving San Diego or slam Diego enough credit. The, the team that's put up four grand slams so far in the postseason. Like, this team is, has hot bats right now. You cannot take them lightly. Don't the, If the Dodgers sleep on them for a sec, I think the Padres have a shot. This is the, the best. The Dodgers don't have to sleep on them. They have the pitching to, to get around This is them. the best series right now in baseball, and I think it's going to be close. I'll take Dodgers, but I think this is going five. I think I think this is going to be a, a clean sweep. I think the Dodgers – each game can be close, and that's fine, but I think the Dodgers take every single game. I, I just believe that their talent level – I mean, they have the best player in baseball right now, and that would be Mookie Betts. They, they have an absolutely incredibly star-studded lineup, uh, and he is the, the head of that. I, I just don't think that with their talent level at, the, at uh, on the mound and in the batting lineup that any – team including the Padres is really going to match up with them um but so for the AL right you have the Yankees and the Astros I have a feeling I know where you're going but tell me what your prediction is for that seven game series I think the Yankees are on a revenge tour they want to make up for what has happened to them uh, against the Astros all the the crap that they have had to put up with all the cheating scandals that the Astros have been uh, a part of. The Yankees are going to put it to them. They should have won last year and moved on to the World Series. But it's because we didn't, you know, now and now the Yankees have Garrett Cole. So I think that's the real difference maker without Justin Verlander for the Astros and now Garrett Cole against his old team. I, I think that, this is going to be fun to watch, obviously, but Yankees are going to crush them. So what's the prediction? Yankees in four, Yankees in five. Uh, I'll take Yankees in six. I, I think that you still got to respect the Astros. Uh, I don't think the Yankees pitching is that deep that they can hold off the Astros offense every single game, but I think that they have a more than enough to get past this this Astros uh, pitching rotation and, and, and to to figure out how to how to stop this this offense. Yeah, I have the Yankees beating the Astros in five. I just don't think the Astros they've had plenty of injuries that they're you know that'll be their their caveat here. That'll be their their issue. Um, they they rely on one pitcher way too much. Zach Greinke is the guy, and I think that the Yankees are going to absolutely tee off on this pitching staff. 
uh, it'll be very interesting for sure, but I think the Yankees will will have a gentleman's sweep in five here, move on to the World Series. Um, that being said, we both have the Braves and the Dodgers moving on. Who do you have in that series? I think this, like I said, this is a lot more clear cut. Uh, the Braves are not getting past the, the Dodgers in this one. And I, I think this is a clear sweep across the board. I'll take Dodgers in four. Yeah, I think this will be a gentleman's sweep. I'm I'm right there with you. You and your um, gentleman think... sweeps, jeez, <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, I I believe this will be another five game series. The Dodgers again. Just There's have... no gentleman on the Dodgers. Oh, Mookie Betts is the best player in baseball, yeah. and he's a gentleman and a scholar. Boston sewage living in L.A. Yeah. <sighs> Lord have mercy on your soul. All right. Um. So the, then we have our World Series matchup clear as day yankees dodgers the the matchup that we predicted oh. in the in the preseason this is it's like the matchup that we we all want to see oh, yeah. um we are now predicting it'll happen now uh who do you have and why uh yeah there's no way the yankees are losing to the dodgers this is th- this has been hyped up for too long this is something we've been waiting to see i don't think you're getting past the Yankees pitching and the Yankees offense. I don't care how stacked the Dodgers are. That can only get you so far. The Yankees ha- are on a mission to get what is rightfully theirs, and that's another World Series win. Uh huh. Right. Um. Yeah, I know. I know you're you're a hater, obviously. So so you're you're clearly rooting against the Yankees, but you can't hate. No, for, I just believe that you can't you keep know. hating. You can't keep hating. You're you're just a simp Red Sox fan, you know. I I can't help that your team isn't gonna do anything for the next ten years. You're about to lose your best why player. We, why are we talking about the Red? We already lost our best player. I because, don't care. Because because you're why just why are we talking you're about just, the Red Sox? Because you're upset. You have to watch the Yankees win win everything. And, and I just chose them to win to go to the World Series. I don't think I'm that upset. Mm. I think you're just a, I think, a sour New Yorker who nope. just struggles with with the fact that you haven't won in a decade. Oh, I'm sorry. We've been cheated out and you, the you, last yeah. couple of years. Doesn't matter. We beat that same cheating team, so it doesn't matter to me. Because you cheated yourself. No, just we didn't. didn't. Ca- you just didn't get caught. There was an investigation that said we didn't cheat. Where's I don't your, care where's, what you Where's your old head coach? Hey, hey, where's your old head coach? Fuck up. Thank Not you. in right. baseball. That's right. Right, we we fired Ron Renicky. Anyway, um, Not him. <laughs> so this is the lineup you have to contend with. Mookie Betts, Corey Seager, Justin Turner, Max Muncy, Will Smith, Cody Bellinger, A.J. Pollock, Jock Peterson, and Chris Taylor. Yeah, there's no shot that the Yankees are winning this series. Uh, I believe that the Dodgers will win in six. I believe that the Dodgers have the requisite talent to absolutely dominate this. You are not going to get past Kershaw. You are not going to get past any of these pitchers uh, with without absolutely, uh, you know, your best possible game being played. Overall, the, the Dodgers will be the World Series champions. They went all in on this season. They're going to reap the reward of that. And, uh, you know, forever, this will be known as the, the Dodgers season. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You're just out of your mind. You you can read off you, a list of names all Nick, you want, Nick. But that you means are absolutely a homer. nothing. Your, your your ideas and I your, can go. You want me to read off mean the, the Yankees to roster nothing, too? Nothing. Yankee. Why would you want to read trash? <laughs> it's why a lot you, better than would, the Dodgers. No, it's not. A lot better than that sewage. No, what are you talking about? The Yankees for how many years in a row have led the league in strikeouts? I mean, their entire lineup's a walking strikeout. What are you talking about? Uh, and look at all the runs the Yankees have been putting up. So uh, tell me how it's working out for them. Against the Rays. We're talking about the Against Rays. Against all the these Dodgers. teams. You you keep the Yankees healthy and they're staying healthy. You're not getting past them. There's nobody out there that can beat this team. In a, the only in a time series. you can win a World Series when you're playing, uh, when you're taking steroids. What, when you're taking steroids? When you are taking steroids, yes, the Yankees. So you're telling you're telling me that all these guys are taking steroids and they haven't been caught in 2020? Okay. No, you haven't won the World Series. That's why. Okay. Well, when we win it, you haven't won the World Series. When we win it, reason we're all gonna be negative for COVID and negative for steroids, and we'll be celebrating in the streets with uh, like uh, oh, 
<laughs> Wait, are the Yankees going to the Dodgers parade? Is that why they're celebrating? Oh, okay. Oh, nope. Right. Okay. Nope. <laughs> well, the the Dodgers can go uh, walk into those fires for all I care. Jesus, that's terrible. Well, <laughs> trash organization. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I know uh, the Yankees are a oh, trash organization. God. All right, so as we uh, wrap up this show, I want to thank you all for listening. Thank you for getting to this point. And thank you for patronizing us as you listen to Nick spew off about absolutely nothing. Um, Go Yankees. <laughs> I want to hammer this home. Like and subscribe to the video, damn it. <laughs> listen, I, I've seen your names, okay? Now I know I've seen the names. It's time. Okay, Paul, stop bugging out. Subscribe to the channel. Like the video. Comment. Let's go. We need to get more subscribers. We want to absolutely dominate this YouTube game. Let's get it popping, okay? Uh, make sure that you guys are, in all seriousness, make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel. It's absolutely free. It helps us a lot, not just viewing-wise, but if you can subscribe, we'd absolutely appreciate it. Uh, if, you, if you believe that you like this content, if you'd like to see more of it, like the video. It'll show up on your uh, recommended page. Uh, we we would love to be there. We sh we host the show every week. Uh, make sure you head over to YouTube if you're listening to this on the uh, as a podcast. Make sure you head over to YouTube and subscribe to the channel. We would greatly appreciate it. With that said, thank you for listening. Signing off for now. Peace and love. Everybody, be safe. Take care.